It's the Tom Hartman University Book Club. Today we're reading from Free Trade Doesn't Work, What Should Replace It and Why by Ian Fletcher. This is from the introduction, uh, which is titled Why We Can't Trust the Economists. America's Trade, uh, the book, by the way, was written, uh, I think, around 2010 or 11. America's trade deficit, not $696 billion in 2008, $701 billion in 2007, and a world record $760 billion in 2006. Even if it's fallen by half in 2009, a temporary plunge we've seen in past recessions that probably doesn't sig signify, signify underlying improvement. A $370 billion trade deficit is still astronomical by any reasonable historical standard. To be fair, the trade deficit is not a perfect indicator of free trade's cost. A nation can always ba balance its trade by crude measures like forcing down wages by political fiat. So hypothetically, we could have a small deficit and a large trade problem. Plenty of impoverished third world nations have balanced trade, and a single year's deficit means nothing. But with numbers this high, our deficit is obviously a big problem, if it's a problem at all. And yet Americans remain afraid to do anything about it. The dangers of protectionism are notorious, and questioning free trade in an intellectually serious way runs into deep waters of economics very fast. So we remain paralyzed in the face of crisis. Over the last 20 years, Americans have brought over $6 trillion, that's trillion with a T, more from the world, bought more from the world than we have sold back to it. That's over $20,000 per American. Ironically, if the U.S. were a developing country, our deficits would have reached the 5% level that the International Monetary Fund takes as the benchmark of financial crisis. The U.S. economy has ceased generating any net new jobs in internationally traded sectors in either manufacturing or services. The comforting myth persists that America is shifting from low-tech to high-tech employment, but we are not. We're losing jobs in both and shifting to non-trade services, which are mostly low-value added and thus ill-paid jobs. According to the Commerce Department, all our net new jobs are in categories such as security guards, waitresses, and the like. The vaunted new economy has not contributed a single net new job to America in this century. Not one. The alchemy of, financial, of international finance that lets America run a seemingly infinite overdraft against the rest of the world looks suspicious, too, because that's what it means to endlessly import more than we export. But where does the money come from at the end of the day? Can we really get something for nothing forever? Or are we in for another crisis like the 2008 financial crisis? Subprime mortgages looked too good to be true, and then they blew up. The aftershocks are still hitting us. Is trade going to be the next shoe to drop? Common sense seems to say that American workers are going to have problems when we trade with nations such as China and India, where the average wage is a dollar an hour or less. Corporate America even admits with barely concealed glee that competition from foreign labor has American workers pinned. As one Goodyear vice president put it, quote, until we get real wage levels down much closer to those of the Brazils and Koreas, we cannot pass along productivity gains to wages and still be competitive, end quote. Brazil, Korea, our wages? These nations and others are booming as exporters to the United States, but they remain par far too poor to take back enough of our exports to balance our trade. Their combination of dreadful wages and regulatory standards on the one hand and winning economic strategies on the other have had so far produced nothing like the living standards needed to make them significant importers of American goods. Despite recent decades of economic growth, there are still over a billion people in Asia learning, earning less than $2 a day. Working conditions are the flip side of low pay in developing countries. Production methods long ago abandoned in the developed world, many of them dangerous and envi environmentally unsound, are still widely in use. In India, for example, foundry workers often don't wear socks, shoes, protective headgear, earplugs, or even eye protection. Often wearing no more than boxer shorts, they squat on the floor next to roaring furnaces. Charles Dickens has moved to Asia. The environment is threatened also. Thousands of foundries in China run on industrial-grade coke with no pollution control devices in their smokestacks, creating a plume of smoke that stretches across the Pacific on satellite photos. Chlorofluorocarbons are banned in the United States, but still used in China as a blowing agent for the production of polyurethane foam cushions and the like, providing a significant cost advantage for Chinese manufacturers. None of this happens by accident. Foreign governments treat trade as war and use, <coughs> excuse me, and use every trick in the book, legal and illegal under international agreements, to grab, grab their industries a competitive advantage. And even when they don't cheat, they are often more skilled in cultivating their industries than we are. Toyota somehow didn't go bankrupt when GM did. 
All these facts impinge upon America because of free trade. But economists keep telling us everything will be fine. According to them, free trade is good for us and they can prove it. 93% of American economists surveyed support free trade. This inescapably raises the question of whether they've been doing their jobs or whether America should stick with the policy that they've recommended. This is a book about real world economic problems, brutally real problems. But it's also a book about economic theory because in economics, raw facts don't mean much without a theory to interpret them. This is especially true for parts of economics that are as controversial and theoretically unsettled as trade. Wrong theories helped get, get America into its current trade mess, so we need to get the right theories to get us out of it. Not only theories, of course, but we won't be able to do without them. Can't we just find a practical solution? That's the instinct of many Americans who find economic theory obtruse and often baffling. Unfortunately, not. Free trade doesn't work.